today. We, um, earlier this year, we had a representative from the Hama community visiting our studio in Denmark. And then after that, they invited us to come here today to talk. And we are very honored to be here today. So thank you for the invitation. We're here today to talk to you about our project called Real or Fake News. It's an educational VR game. And today, we're going to delve into the process of making this game. But first, we'd just like to briefly introduce ourselves. So yeah, we're called Vislab Studios. We do games and VR games. And I'm called Andreas. <laughs> and I'm the everything that is revolving around graphic, meaning from concept art to 3D model and animation. Yeah, is... and I'm, uh, I'm Yannick. I'm the other half of Vislab Studios. I co-founded together with Andreas. I do all the, all the project management, all the technical stuff. So I'm doing all the coding, and Andreas is doing all the, all the graphic stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oop. Try it again. There we go. <laughs> So what is this project, Real or Fake News? So it's a big collaboration between four libraries, uh, Viborg, Vejle, Rødder, and Ballerup in Denmark, and each had a local partnering school as well. There's IGK in Aarhus and educational consultants, and us as Vislab Studios hired as the VR experts and the production team. It's all funded by the Danish Digital Libraries and Viborg Animation Strategy. Uh, yeah, and it elapsed from February last year to January this year. Just, oh. <laughs> Just gonna keep it, yeah, maybe not. Um, so why is this project, and why is it happening? Bebo Library always likes to uh, explore new tools for education. And last year, and before that, and still, fake news was a big topic about fake news in social media and news in social media, and who was sending this, and how could the young kids and all the students discern fake from real news. And th so they sought out to educate children about source criticism and about digital formation, and then they want to explore using VR as a tool. And they want to inform about their digital library resources as well. For example, the Factorlink. Yeah. So the, some of the project goals were to create uh, a safe training ground for the kids uh, aged 13 to 16 to navigate media. So they were supposed to be immersed in this uh, VR trial arena where they could kind of try out uh, fake news and real news and see the difference without getting actual uh, F in getting any bad grades or without failing anything serious. So we want to create a VR game and a teaching program as well, and we want to create this as a social experience where half a class could be entertained at the same time. And so here we see the final, some sketch images from the final game. So the final theme became about uh, an accident at a nuclear plant in the fictional town of Kropenke. The students were divided into four groups, uh, an NGO, the citizens of Kropenke, the nuclear plant, and the editors of a newspaper. And the editors then took turns to be the journalists who were sent into VR, and research uh, the accident, and then ask all the other groups, interview the other groups, gather notes and information to uh, the, final, uh, the final parts of the game. They're creating an article, and then they either won the Pulitzer Prize or lo lost their jobs if they released fake news. <laughs> so yeah, now we'd like to take a step back to the beginning of the project to talk you through the process of creating this. So in the beginning, it was, uh, yeah, it was funded by the DDB, and of course, it always comes to some requirements and that we're setting the framework for the, for the project. So we have to use these digital resources, for example, as you saw, Factorlink, to, uh, to give out the real facts, and also part of the cheating program to be educated about using Factorlink and other resources like this. Then we had to entertain half a class or engage half a class at once with one headset, which mean, meant it had to be a social experience, which was why we divided the class into groups. Uh, this was quite a unique framework. We hadn't seen any other game quite like this. Um, so we had a unique challenge. It was really interesting to, to engage in. And now we'd like to show you more about this process. Yeah. yeah. So we began this whole process with a kickoff workshop. So we used a design sprint method to kick the whole uh, project off. So we had a two-day workshop where we, on the first day, we would generate ideas. So we, we, we would be concerned with generating as many ideas as we could the first day, just explore a really broad range of ideas. And then the second day, we would then uh, narrow down and solidify those ideas. Um, it was really, really important that we all gather together in this beginning workshop because we all had to agree on this uh, concept because this, we had this felt a uh, feeling of ownership, all of us, from the project because we, from the get-go, we were all together in creating the concept together. So Yannick was taking care of, uh, that the framework for the uh, workshop was really solid and that we have game design ideas on all the projects uh, that we could potentially develop. I, on the other hand, I would be drawing uh, pictures for all the ideas. So in the first day, we had around 50 pages on the wall. So the whole room was decorated with uh, drawings. 
So they would each uh, function as a visual anchor for all the ideas generated. That meant on the second day it was really, really easy for us to dwell back into what did we create, and then we could start pulling down the ideas that didn't work, and then we could narrow down to that one idea. So actually what you see here is me drawing what would become the layout from the first room in the game. So already in this workshop we could sort of see where this was pointing into. After this development, thank you, we would do a paper prototype. A paper prototype is like the first step in game creation, because this is where you can still react really fast and you can uh, act really fast, meaning real cheap also. So we created the whole game as a kind of a board game that you can play through. Uh, this meant we could try out all the, like test the concepts and uh, like did the things like flow correctly as we predicted. We could also try out some of the graphics. Uh, so yeah, it was really, really good that we could test it out. And we tested it with the project partners. And this was really good because then we could already hear, we could go through these iteration cycles and then already here start to implement some of the test feedbacks that we uh, would get. And then we would delve into our digital prototype. Yeah. The digital prototype then led to that we could test with the target audience. And this was really, really important because we test the first with the project partners, but we are not the target audience. So we understand the world different than teenagers and young kids they do. So there are things that we cannot catch as, uh, we, so we're not yet like the target for this group. We cannot catch all the mistakes that potentially could show up. So it was really, really important that we tested early with the target audience. So yeah, this feedback that we got from them is the really, really important and the only thing we can truly rely on. Despite we are doing, doing this early test, it meant that also some of the parts of the game were not uh, in place yet. We had this teaching program, so there would be a teaching program, then the actual game, and then some reflection afterwards. We didn't have the uh, initial part, so it created a little bit of confusion. So we had to look aside uh, from that in this test phase here. But what we did find out that was the kids were really like brave, they were fearless, they just jumped right into this uh, new medium. So that was really, really great to see that they had a lot of courage. And we did find some really, really important things already there. For example, the language that we used. Everything in this game is re revolving around an accident and a nuclear plant. So a lot of the terms are from nuclear, the nuclear world. So we had to tone those, language, uh, those terms down and the language so they became more understandable. Another thing, we, in the beginning, we had a setup. So this is supposed to function with half a class. So we would have the person inside VR, then we would have a microphone, and then we had three groups. One from each group had to then get up to the microphone and speak into the microphone to communicate with the person inside VR. What we did not uh, anticipate was that actually a lot of students to just go up into, uh, to a microphone and speak in front of a class was really daunting for them. So we had to cut this away, and it was really good that we tested that early. After this, we are ready for the next iteration. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so I just talked a bit about this. Um, this is kind of our workflow, and it shows a bit about how important it is to iterate. So if you see here, we start out with idea generation and concepting. We did that at the workshop. Then we developed uh, the paper prototype, got some feedback. Then we went through it once more, where we created the gray box prototype, which was the first one we tested here. Um, so actually, this one, we went through this cycle two times now. And we found that it was, uh, yeah, we really needed to simplify the game before the target audience understood everything they needed to do. Because they needed to understand it the first time, because they need to go through the teaching program, then they play this once, and then they reflect. They can't play this several times in a row. Um, so they needed to really, yeah, get it the first time. So we removed ob obstacles, as for example, the microphone, and we opened up the world a lot more so the students weren't, uh, and, uh, weren't uh, afraid to engage at all. And then we were ready for the next cycle, where we went through this all again. We reflected on the feedback we got, uh, validated some ideas and removed some other elements. Then we created a new concept, developed further, and then we were ready for the next test. Mm -hmm. And when you test for a second time, and it's important that you also test with another group, because if uh, you test with the same group, they have some preconceptions about what is going to happen. They've seen something before, they know a bit about what is going to happen. Uh, so well, luckily, we had access to another class that we could test with. And this time, we had the teaching program ready, which really helped a lot, because this gave a much better understanding for the students. Because they, they were divided into the roles beforehand, and they researched the theme beforehand, so they, were not, uh, they, they didn't get overloaded with information when they were actually going to play the VR game. So this gave an overall much better in, engagement uh, from the students. And we only had to do some minor tweaks before we were ready for the final version, which is the one you see here. Here you see the final version of the office uh, that the reporter is in. Uh, where they can build an article, you see a map in the background with some circles. On those, you can navigate to, for example, the nuclear power plant. 
where you can uh, talk to the to that group and then find out what are they their uh, version of the truth and what what are they saying and get their hints and then go back to the office with them and put them into your article. Yeah. So to summarize some of these important findings that we made during this production, that this was quite a unique challenge. We couldn't find any other game that has tried to incorporate like a social experience, meaning that we had to engage half a class together with VR, and VR is normally a solitary experience, so we had to really find a way to engage a full class. So what we did was we looked at a lot of board games, because board games are really great at engaging people, so we took the best mechanics we could find there, for example, roll cards and hidden objects, things you clues and things you have to find. So we took the best we could from the board game world, incorporated it into the VR world. So yeah, it was a really good mix of those two things. What we really found out was to keep it simple, every obstacle that you can remove that would hinder the flow, that would break the flow of the game, we would take out because this is quite a lot of information for the students to play through, so we would keep it as simple as possible. Then we figured out as well that the social dynamic is really, really, really important. We had some test class where the, the, the dialogue would be really, really uh, hindered by them being shy. There was other classes where somebody would be goofing around and then destroy the whole process as well. So what we did find out that the teacher had to be really engaged in navigating and guiding the class. So, for example, if they were too shy, then encourage a more lively discussion. If somebody would be destroying the whole experience for the others, then just tone it down a little bit. So the teachers here are really, really uh, important. So all these things we, we figured out because this is quite a pioneering game, so it was really important for us to uh, solidify the knowledge we had about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here at the end, we'd like to talk a bit about generally VR in, uh, in education. What we found uh, in our uh, experience was the students were really into VR. Like it was really engaging for the target audience that we created this game for. They were really into it and wanted to try it. And that's, that was great, that was great news. Uh, and they were also really immersed into this safe uh, training ground where they were kind of allowed to fail. So they were allowed to try things out. In the, some of the first versions we had, uh, we allowed the students to, to throw around objects. We found out that was a bit too distracting, so we removed that. But they weren't afraid to try out if they could and try out if they could interact with things and how they were supposed to do this. And new technology in general is very exciting. And VR is, uh, is still quite a new technology for students, at least. We also found that it was quite attentive to the students because it looked a lot better than normal educational games, many of the games they had seen at least. And that's also because we come from a gaming background, so it was important for us as game developers also to make something that looked, that looked good uh, so we could present it, for example, today. Um, and th that made the students relate to it more from... Uh, they could relate to it because they played leisure games as well, and where they could... Uh, so they weren't afraid of engaging with these graphics because they could understand what things were supposed to be. So the quality as well really matters. And at the end, we also found that even the students uh, inside VR and outside VR really glued to the screen. Um, so yeah, they found it overall really engaging. So it was a good way to, uh, to use VR. Mm -hmm. So this uh, basically sums right. up what uh, we had to tell you today. We are being, we're, we're having an exhibit outside in the exhibit area. So if you have further questions, then please come talk to us there. We have the game also showcased out there so you can actually try it out. It's way different to be inside the game in a VR experience than just looking at it on screen. So do yourself a favor and come out and try it and then talk to us. And we would love to speak more about the game out there. But other than that, we would just like to say thank you. Yeah. <laughs>